Hello and welcome to A Tribe Called Health. The Tribe convenes weekly for a roundtable discussion on health, fitness, and sustainable living. We're about to get started, but first a disclaimer. The information on this broadcast should not be considered medical or legal advice. If you need medical or legal advice, speak to a doctor or a lawyer. If you are a doctor or a lawyer and need health or fitness advice, get in the tribe. On today's show, we welcome health and fitness coach, blogger, author, and general badass, Sean Flanagan. Sean's going to drop a few truth bombs and probably some F-bombs about diet and exercise. Hide the children, folks, because we're about to open up a BPA-free can of whoop-ass on dietary dogma. This is A Tribe Called Health. This is Joe Rignola of wellnesspunks.com, and with me, as always, John Randalls of sexfoodandkettlebells.com, and Eric Hulse, Eric Hulse of ericholse.com. What's up, boys? What's going on, guys? What's happening? Uh, you know, just super psyched for, for today's uh, very dramatic show, I have a feeling. <laughs> <laughs> What's happening with you guys? Not much. I'm... I. I'm doing this liver gallbladder cleanse, you know, the, the protocol from yeah. F1, and mm -hmm. it's like the extended version one. Uh oh. And I'm, it's like, I know, right? Yeah, and it's I, rough. What yeah, it's a little rough. So, right now, I'm drinking this super fast. Um, I don't know. It's supposed to help break up the crap in your gallbladder. And, and well, it's interesting. I'm doing the opposite and drinking tequila. <laughs> <laughs> nice, right on, right on. I'm thinking about doing a liver support and liver cleanse just so I could drink more. Not, yeah, that was. That makes sense. Honest. Yeah, but <laughs> it just it tastes horrible. Have you ever had it, Joe? No, I actually yeah. haven't. To be honest with you, now. It's it's so bad. But I just finished a coffee animal. Oh no! <laughs> I did. <laughs> right what, like now. just finished? Yeah. <laughs> like today or this afternoon like two before you got seconds ago <laughs> before we dialed in here I was flat on my back. Uh, yeah, I haven't I haven't ventured down that rabbit hole, no pun intended, yet either. Is it <laughs> just like protocol? Just following protocol. Is it like hot coffee? No. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> Imagine though. No, thank no. you. <laughs> All right. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, introduce our Please. guest. Please do it before we get ourselves uh, in trouble. The, the lovely, ever so popular Sean Flanagan. And uh, he's the man with the broccoli, always. I you. don't have any broccoli with me today, unfortunately, <laughs> though. All right, I got a little bio here on Sean. So, Sean Flanagan is a health and nutrition coach helping clients worldwide break from the traps of conventional dieting. Uh, as a student of health and wellness for over a decade, Sean Flanagan is passionate about helping clients receive the benefits of fundamentally sound nutrition as well as balanced lifestyle. Disgusted by the deception and dumbed down nonsense found in mainstream nutrition, Sean has devoted and continues to devote a considerable amount of time in understanding the underlying science and principles of health. Welcome, Sean. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks for coming on, Sean. My pleasure, my pleasure. What's going on in your world right now, Sean? Well, I had a pretty good nap. It wasn't the best nap in the world, but it was pretty good. Uh, and I had some Indian food today. So that's really the stuff I really want to brag about. The Indian uh, what? You had what? I had some Indian food. You know, buffet. Oh, food, yeah. I get my buffet on. But, cool. Uh, cool. I, don't know, I don't know what you thought he said, Joe. I don't even want to know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to analyze that one later. But... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, that's it. Nice. That's it. That's all. So we we want to ask this sort of obligatory, you know, how did you how did you get started in the in this health and nutrition field? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, I've pre pretty much always been in uh, the health field. Um, when I was like twenty, I started doing some. Uh, I'll just abbreviate and call it some fitness stuff. Um, mm -hmm. And so that, you know, kind of gravitated towards, you know, more conventional personal training path with time. And uh, then I realized that that was the, the nature I was working with people was uh, limited in quite a few ways. Um, so 
year and three months ago, I'm like, I don't really know what I'm going to do with uh, this nutrition thing, but I'm going to start a Facebook fan page. <laughs> um, so that kind of brings us to today of, you know, having, you know, online clients and online programs and all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, I've been working professionally in health for more than half a decade. Um, and I think I started reading like Muscle and Fiction and Flex Magazine at like 12 or 13. So uh, I guess I've been following health stuff for a while now. How do you how do you direct people into really like that are out of the loop, the health loop, like a client or so? Mm -hmm. Because you just mentioned and we were talking before about listening to your body and all that stuff. So if there was somebody who didn't know they had food sensitivities, how would you direct them into kind of discovering that about themselves? Um, yeah, that's a tough question. I guess it would depend on what they have going on. Um, I think some people are kind of like freakily in touch with themselves to make up a word. Um, I'm definitely one of those people. Um, I know other people are, you know, maybe fall somewhere else on that, on that continuum. But, you know, if someone's telling me that, you know, they felt certain symptoms on certain days and I see that their food journal has, you know, a food that, you know, one of the most, like, say, that one of the top five most common allergenic foods, you know, I'll, I'll bring that up. Um, you know, I, I don't know if you can, yeah, if, if you make people become suddenly aware, but you can, you know, encourage them to obviously remove that food and see how they feel, um, you know, things like that. Like, you know, obviously gluten is something that a lot of people are sensitive to, and uh, they don't know it because we eat gluten, you know, we, as in the standard American, um, we eat gluten like three times a day at least. <laughs> you know what mm -hmm. I mean? We have, you know, cereal and sandwiches and then pasta. Right. Um, so how are you going to know that gluten feels, makes you feel like crap if that's literally all you eat? So. And you're always yeah. feeling like, feel like crap, so. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. So, you know, it, it's a matter, you know, I don't know if there's a stock answer to that, but yeah, if, if someone's feeling poor and then I, I try to help them find potential solutions. And, and, and looking at the common sensitivities is, is just a good one to, to go by. Right on. Cool. Cool. Let's dive into to some of the subject matter here. But before before I go on, Sean, I want to make sure that people know where to find you online. Right. Uh, so what, what's, your, what's your website? Uh, Sean Flanagan Wellness uh, dot com. That's my primary website. Uh, I don't know if I should spell out my name because there's a few different possible misspellings. <laughs> we, we will definitely put it in the show notes too. Okay. But go ahead, spell it. Right, so sure, uh, Sean S E A N Flanagan F L A N A G A N uh, Wellness dot com. Um, so we're assuming then, that people know how to spell wellness. Right. That's, that was my <laughs> perhaps erroneous assumption, but I decided I was going to roll with that. Yeah, let's um, go with that. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, uh, you know, Sean Flanagan, Health and Nutrition Coaching, the, the fan page on mm -hmm. Facebook. And I'm also on Twitter, but I'm not going to accept any follows, and I'm never going to tweet, but I am there. <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> Thanks for telling us. Right. <laughs> I just have my uh, Facebook page linked to my Twitter. That's pretty much the only time I tweet. That's about it. So, so we're going to talk about some, some diet dogma. So I think we all sort of lean – towards this ancestral paleo primal thing um, I, I my my take is try not to identify too much with that although I still think it's a pretty good framework where you know where do you line up if, if at all with with your dietary philosophy at this point uh, I don't I don't know what I don't know how to label it um, mm -hmm. I guess I am pro-metabolic, I guess that's how I call it. I'm very much interested in optimizing um, an individual's metabolism. Um, so, you know, using um, biofeedback to find out what works for you as opposed to someone else. Um, I like a lot of paleo, um, and I guess if someone will look at my own diet because of sensitivities, it would probably, I, I generally call it Swiss cocoa paleo, paleo plus <laughs> select dairy plus chocolate. Um, but, um, you know, so that's my personal diet, um, but I, I don't impose that necessarily on others. Um, mm -hmm. at the same time, I think there's a lot of, uh, smarts in the paleo community and, um, the paleo, I'm using quotes there, foods are generally the most nutrient dense, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that everything else is shit and you just need to get rid of it. But, you know, if you're going to, 
remove, you know, foods if you have, you know, a, a legitimate caloric excess, then, you know, maybe the, quote, non-paleo foods would be the first place to go, um, you know, within reason. Um, but, yeah, I, I guess I don't really have a label for it other than uh, pro-metabolic and maybe reluctantly paleo. <laughs> I guess that would be the way to put it. <laughs> What are some what are what are some you know foods that we would maybe classify as not being paleo that you find in many cases are still acceptable or you know necessary to include in a diet? Where would you say are some of your differences with certain clients you know when you're moving outside of the paleo framework? I guess the more you get away from uh, high probability of allergens, I guess there's, it's like a, I think a food becomes by definition more likely to be tolerated. So, you know, corn is probably a little more likely to be tolerated than gluten. Um, you know, and then rice is more likely to be tolerated than corn, and you know, so on and so forth. So, you know, you know, it, it I'm very careful with gluten because it just seems like there's a lot of, it just seems like a lot of people are sensitive to it and don't know it. Um, so I generally encourage people, um, if you, unless you know you tolerate it well, uh, don't eat it, um, or at least you know keep it in, in moderation. Whereas you know other things are less kind of uh, uh, less prevalent, less aggressive. Um, so I mean, you know, if someone tolerates corn well, then I don't see any logical reason why they should you know avoid corn. Um, likewise with rice or, you know, beans. I guess, you know, gluten is really the, the thing I'm, I'm, I'm not saying I'm, an, I'm not going to say I'm anti-gluten. I'm, uh, gluten skeptical, I guess is how I put it. <laughs> but, um, I think just in general, if someone has no reason to believe that they do poorly on something, I don't think they should, um, get rid of it. I might have said that as a double negative, but I think my point came across. <laughs> we got your drift. <laughs> All right, cool. So, as, uh, someone you know, does what you do, and you're, you're particularly, you know, uh, against the grain, as it were, against mm -hmm. the mainstream. You're always trying to, you know, uh, bust, you know, diet myths and things like that. Mm -hmm. What would you say is one of the big, the biggest challenges you come across most commonly when you get a new client, if they've, mm -hmm. like, heard of this latest thing, or if they've, mm -hmm. you know, heard cholesterol is bad for you, or what would you say are some of the big ones that you encounter a lot? that you really try to take down? The um, the one that I personally encounter a lot just because of, you know, whatever, is is the fear of carbohydrates. So that's why I try to attack that so much. Um, right. If I put up a sign on the street and it says nutrition and call 1-800, blah, 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 maybe I'd get more people that are afraid of saturated fat and cholesterol. But it seems in general the people that come to me um, in general are, are, yeah, are afraid of carbohydrates. Um, that's really the, the big thing. Because now, are you talking about what what kind of carbohydrates are you talking about? I'm just saying the nutrient itself. People thinking that oh, if I eat carbs, period. Yeah. Uh, you know, if I if I hit 150 grams of carbohydrates per day, I'm going to hit uh, the insidious fat gain zone or whatever. Um, yeah. I fucking the, hate the the word carb. Carb. Right. I hate <laughs> <laughs> it's so, everybody, that's like it's so it's so annoying that that those those little letters. I hate <laughs> together. You know, what? I think we should bring out the 1990s term "carbos" back. I really like that. Um, it, and I think the reason I I think I I don't mean I'm sorry I I don't mean to cut you off, Sean. Uh -huh, no but worries. the reason I think I hate it so much is because you're exactly right. That's the one thing everybody's freaked out about mm -hmm. is carbs. Carbs. Carbs are bad. They're, they're the devil. They're going to kill you, you know? And it got such a bad name. That's the first thing that people, when I start working with, are exactly are right. The same thing that you just said, that carbs are bad and I'm going to die and I'm going to get right. fat and growth. Right. And only have plantains if you're already lean. If, you, right. if you're not already ripped to shreds, you, you can't have plantains. You have to be <laughs> <laughs> No plantains for you. Yeah, no. Uh, so, so what's your what's your sort of official standpoint on that? Uh, when do you find you know more carbs are appropriate for someone or or not? Sometimes you know what would you say is your experience working with this so far? 
Uh, I just leave it up to the individual. I mean, like I, like I said, most people come to be barely eating any carbs. So in that case, I usually just encourage that they incrementally increase to just, you know, theoretically not shock their body too much. So um, is, that because, is that because you're getting a lot of people through the ancestral health movement? A lot of people are finding you through paleo pages or yeah. and yeah. they've been recently bombarded with a lot of low-carb info that seems to be a yeah. lot of people are trying to go ketogenic, mm -hmm. right? And they're, okay. Mm -hmm. And I, and I think there's also a little bit of like a cultural element where maybe the people that are in general are more educated about health are generally pro-saturated fat, but maybe what comes with that is some sort of, you know, cultural immersion that also makes them, you know, afraid of um, carbohydrates. So, you know, so it's a matter of, yeah, all the other pages that they follow, um, et cetera, et cetera, and just kind of the, the community that surrounds them. Now, um, Swan, people, it's because they don't know, and we're here to educate them, mm -hmm. but they, they, they're just following mainstream with the carbohydrate thing. So mm -hmm. they think they're doing well with taking them out of their diet. But what are some things that you've noticed or that are, are that health-wise when you do take them out of your diet for an extended period of time? Like how, uh, can, how can it be counterproductive? Let me think of the big one. I mean, just the, on a on a scientific level, um, it seems to me that, that the evidence is rather compelling that the less carbohydrates you consume, the um, less bioavailable thyroid hormone you have. Um, so that's that's a big one. So that has a lot of implications. So energy level, you know, anxiety, because um, if you're low on thyroid, you know, theoretically, if I understand things correctly, you'd run more on adrenaline and cortisol. Um, you know, so, you know, feeling cold, that's obviously a sign of, you know, low metabolism by definition because body temperature goes and metabolism goes. Um, yeah, energy, you know, all that kind of stuff. I mean, there's, there's a lot of things just so, just the symptoms of low metabolism often go with decreased carbohydrate intake or at least, you know, conscious decreased carbohydrate intake. Um, so, you know, that has a lot of implications. And then, you know, you know, a lot of times it's just someone's just not eating enough food because they took out one macronutrient group. You know what I mean? So it's, you know, they're eating 1,200 calories a day, which also, again, contributes to, you know, you know feeling foggy and having no energy. Um, mm -hmm. And it's not, so, not just that they're not consuming carbohydrates. It's because in the void of carbohydrates, they're not eating enough food. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, <laughs> that's the big thing. So, yeah. Joe, so let's... Yeah, I was just going to say, Joe, kind of, what's your input in general with this topic right now, you know? What are your thoughts? Um, yeah, I mean, um, I, I definitely see that, um, you know, too low, the, the thyroid needs some sugar, basically, some glucose, and needs insulin to convert T4 into T3, um, and I see that a lot in my practice, too. I think uh, I'm, I'm in the same boat as Sean, we're starting to get people who have sort of been doing this sort of healthier eating for a while already, and maybe... <clears throat> have gotten too attached to that low-carb uh, um, way of eating and have done some damage. Um, other, you know, the cold hands and feet Sean talked about, um, pulse, you know, lower pulse rate, um, the depression, anxiety, uh, digestive issues, uh, talking about really slow motility. Um, it could affect cholesterol. It's going to raise um, LDL because the lower thyroid is going to downregulate LDL receptors. It, it literally, honestly, every single every single cell in the body has thyroid receptors. So, you know, you talk about what are the symptoms. It, it, the easier question is, are there any you know what aren't the symptoms of low thyroid? Yeah. So yeah, so yeah. A lot of a lot of you know people, um, as I understand, even when I first kind of got into this way of eating, uh, you know, a lot of what we all preach, I think, is a is a huge increase in in fat, you know, particularly saturated fat. You know, now we're learning, but a lot of people feel or have been told that with this, the more you increase this fat, you need to decrease the carbohydrate in the opposite direction. You know, pretty much switch the whole calorie shift from those carbs to the fats, and and that they're saying, you know, having the high fat and the moderate to high carb is where you're going to really hit weight gain issues. 
Um, how do you guys feel about that? Do you think people should have like a high fat, you know, moderate carb diet? Is it very different from person to person? I think it's different for everybody because it can go along with your activity level. It can go along with your your sex. I don't think it's a there's a correct number to go along with wh how much you should be eating and how much you should not be eating. I think it goes along with the individual person and what works for them. But I think a good, you know, there are there are good gauges, you know, to go along with. Um, where you should start and it should also it should it should really it's a good indicator if the amount that you're eating I believe through my experience and through working with people that if you are feeling satisfied from one meal to the next if you're not feeling lightheaded if you're in good energy if you um, are clear and focused and in a good mood then you found the right portion that is right for you it's all I think it's all experimental you know, that's why you have to take food journals, what you've written down, how, how much you've eaten. It, it's not calories. Calories suck. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's, really, it's really looking at your food like a pie chart and seeing, okay, I'm eating this pie. amount of food today. Pie. Look at pie. your food like pie. Oh, uh, not <laughs> pie. <laughs> or maybe <laughs> pie. <laughs> You Remember, know? this is like the non-dogma show, so exactly. if you want to eat pie, go for it. <laughs> you know, and Let see pie. the amount of carbs that you're eating and then fats and proteins and always readjusting those so that you are your blood sugar is stabilized and you're feeling good in between meals and so on. Sean, what do you think? Uh, I think Eric covered uh, most of what I would ever say. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, largely, I largely agree with that. Uh, yeah, well, let's mean, talk they, about the cal. Let's talk about the calories. Do do calories matter? Do calories count? Should we should we even be aware of them or or not? Yeah, um, they definitely. I mean, they definitely matter. The question is, you know, do we need to uh, analyze them with the calculator and all that shit? Um, I guess it's a matter of whether someone can handle that and not feel neurotic about their food. Is I think mm -hmm. I think the psychological element of this whole health thing. Uh, kind of gets thrown under the bus a lot, where we kind of talk mm -hmm. about calories and fat and protein, but we don't talk about thinking. Um, so I personally, I don't, I've never counted the calories. Uh, I don't think I would be able to do that and feel like it's a healthy relationship with food. If someone else can and they get valuable input from that, then I think there's something about that. And I think there's something to be said for that. Let's dig in a little deeper on that because uh, right. let's let's talk about mindset. Um, mm -hmm. You know what are what are some of the the issues with getting really attached to a, a food label, whether it's paleo, or primal, or vegan, or clean diet, or whatever the case may be? What are what are some issues that can arise from that? If you are lab if you give yourself a label, um, by definition, you're attaching yourself to that, and it's almost like it can be an identity crisis if you have to change that, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. It's like changing, you know. It's not a it's not a mild um, event in someone's life if they change religion. You know what I mean? If someone goes, you know, if someone's a Christian one day and they're a Muslim the next, that's going to be a pretty dramatic shift, and you know they're going to have to, you know, change a lot of things in their life potentially, um, you know, at least internally. Um, and there's no need to attach that to food. You know what I mean? There's no need to make food such a dramatic thing like, oh well, I was paleo and. And now, you know, <laughs> you just, I think, I think there can be, I think attaching to something to yourself, I mean, even with that, even with like, I, I was using the paleo label on myself for a while, and I felt that it was kind of tying my hands, like, oh, well, I don't know if I can talk about the fact that I drink coconut water, because coconut water is not paleo, you know, like, I think, I think you just, you put yourself into a corner. When I when I first went paleo and, and I went like really strict paleo, I really just really strict paleo for like a year. But a couple months in, I had had some great benefits. I had lost a lot of weight. I was feeling great. I felt awesome. I was comfortable with my diet. There's a couple nights in a row where I had dreams that I was eating like cupcakes and cinnamon buns and French fries and stuff. And, <laughs> and in my dream. I was destroyed at the fact that I broke my paleo diet. 
It, the dream wasn't actually about the fact that I wanted to eat these foods. It was about the fact that I was stressing out that I was like, oh my god, what have I done? I broke paleo. Like, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not paleo anymore. I ate cupcakes once, right? It was like stressful <laughs> dreams I was having. And I woke up and I was like, whoa, you know, that's messed up. <laughs> like, I think that sometimes this, this happens a lot. Um, you know, sometimes we, we post something on our Facebook page or, or I go out with friends and they know, they know how I eat, they know how I am and maybe we're out for a steak somewhere and I decide to get a beer or get some fries with my steak and they're, everyone at the table is like, whoa, you can't do that, John. I'm like, what are you talking about? They're like, you're, you're paleo. That's not paleo. I was like, I can eat whatever the hell I want. I just choose not to eat certain things yeah. most of the time. And I think that's, I think that's that's important for people to get because sometimes these labels are very limiting and they cause a real anxiety and stress if you, if you decide suddenly that you want to eat something else that day or if you find some new research and you want to try something else, you feel like you're cheating yourself or you know uh, losing your identity because of this label that you win. So yeah, that's my experience with that. That's why I really don't go for the labels. Anymore. Yeah, yeah, true. So, Sean, what are what are some of the uh, pitfalls of, of a paleo primal template paleo diet? What do you think some of the pitfalls might be? Well, like we already talked about, often that comes with low carb. Obviously, it's not um, necessarily low carb. Like I like I said, my own personal diet is you know basically paleo because um, I don't tolerate grains, um, but I eat a lot of carbs. Um, but you know, everyone else. Or not everyone else. I shouldn't say that. Hyperbolic. But a lot of other people will say, "Oh, I get my carbs from vegetables." And then you look at what they eat, and it's fucking. Hey, there's your first F bomb. It's Yay, fucking nice. uh, <laughs> broccoli and spinach and peppers all day. And then you do the math, and you're like, "Congratulations, you had 30 grams of carbohydrates today. You are in ketosis. So, so much for getting plenty of carbohydrates." Mm -hmm. um, Have some you know, fucking ice cream. <laughs> right there we go. <laughs> um, so I mean that's that's you know that's the main one like across the board is it often comes with the carb phobia or I should say even if you're not irrationally afraid of carbohydrates, if you're not if you're on a paleo type diet and you're not actively working at getting those carbs, you're probably not going to get them. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, unless you're making sure you have a sweet potato, a potato, plantains, or yucca, uh, you know, or some other starchy tube or starchy veggie with, with your meal, those carbs aren't going to add up, period. So you've got to really focus on it because it's not like, you know, again, the standard American diet, the carbs take care of themselves. You wake up, mm -hmm. you have cereal, you go out to lunch, you have a sandwich. Carbs, mm -hmm. are, <laughs> The carbs are there. Um, but, yeah, if you're doing a, a paleo-type diet, you... Unless you're trying to get the carbs in, you're by definition going to be low carb. Period. Do uh, you think there's a benefit to, to being low carb? Do you think there's a, there's a therapeutic benefit to like a ketogenic diet for a period of time, or do you think that maybe that's not appropriate for most people? Uh, yeah, probably not appropriate for most people. I mean, I'm sure that um, you know, of course, medical conditions, but that's outside of probably all all of our uh, bailiwicks. Um, certainly outside of mine. So, you know, if someone has a medical condition that responds to ketosis, I'm not going to tell them to, you know, you know, shut up and eat some ice cream. You know, that, but that's, mm -hmm. you know, that's their decision. That's between them and their doctor. But for the general population, for the people that are just health-focused um, and tolerate them fine, you know, then there's really no point. But um, I wanted to segue that from, you know, the low-carb is kind of the across-the-board thing. But um, the other thing is just um, calorie needs. And if someone, you know, is in a position where they need a lot of calories um, for whatever reason, let's, you know, whether that be their, their history and they were previously diet on the law. John, again. <laughs> my mom. Oh, uh, so answer it. Mom, you have to stay on. You have to stay on camera, though. Hi, uh, hey, mom. No, no. Tell tell her we said hi. Happy Mother's Day. Late Happy first. Mother's Day. <laughs> Why don't you guys ever get phone calls? I can't unplug all the phones in my house when we do this. <laughs> you guys not, no one ever calls you? No, nobody likes me. <laughs> my phone's on, on um, vibrate. Yeah. Okay. I, actually, I, still have, I still have an old school like landline phone too, uh, right? Yeah. I have one in my house. I don't have one 
in my office. I, I'm sorry, I, but I was, I was very interested. I'm <laughs> fired up too. Um, yeah, so you know, depending on someone's calorie needs, so some people obviously you know have you know substantial calorie needs, at least relatively speaking. Whether that be maybe they were you know previously dieted their brains out, or maybe they're you know six foot four, two hundred twenty pounds. You know, they're obviously going to need you know a bit of muscle, a bit of food um, if they're really active. Yada yada yada. So, I mean, the higher someone's caloric needs are, you know, by definition, the less picky they can be about their food. You know what I mean? If, if mm -hmm. you're at 700 calories so far today and you have to eat another 3,000, now is not the time to go, well, you know, that beef, it's not grass-fed. <laughs> oh, you you've got to eat that. You, yeah. you seriously yeah. need to eat. <laughs> like, so, it's, mm -hmm. it's, I, I think it's a continuum of, you know, food quality is important. Um, and in a kind of a continuum based upon, you know, um, I guess your metabolic needs. If if, if you're if you only need 1,800 calories per day legitimately, you know that's something that's really easy to do. If uh, you know, no matter what your food source, you may as well make it you know quote the best. You know, um, if you have to get 4,000 calories, yeah, like I said, now is not the time to be picky. <laughs> you know, be you know aim for the best you can certainly, but you know, you know, don't be neurotic about it. Don't be mm -hmm. overly restrictive. Do you do you think that see? Do you think that a lot of this, you know, very low carbon yet, and and as you said, be neurotic about it? Do you think this stems from people, even though you know we come from a type of community now that's become very you know health conscious? It's about chasing health, not not always chasing looks or or chasing a certain you know, social expectation, but searching for health. Do you think that within that, people are still searching for something unhealthy? Like, do you know how, you know, we have obsession with extreme diets or extreme fat burning pills because people want to get to like an extreme level that for many people will be unhealthy for them. So then they find this new way of eating and through our coaching, we teach people about how to look for progress in terms of measuring health right? Not always measuring inches or how well you see your abs and things like that. Those can be indicators of health, but not always, right? Mm -hmm. Do you think that a lot of the time people are healthy, they found a diet that works for them, and there's still sort of a, a mental social issue where they feel like they're not there yet and they need something more extreme and they start to look for extreme results within a healthy way of eating. Does that make sense? Do you think there's a little of that going on in the, in the industry still? from the, the side that we're on? That's, that's an interesting point. That's not something I encounter a lot. Um, but, yeah, I'm sure it's there. I mean, obviously, there's, you know, different hacks for everything every day. You can find people, you know, fussing about, you know, all sorts of different kind of minutia. And, you know, whether that's, you know, healthy or not, you know, is, I guess, up to that individual. But, yeah. you know, certainly people can, can become overly fixated and overly aggressive, right, and, and make it an unhealthy thing. Sean, how do you how do you feel exercise fits into our healthy lifestyles? You right, because I know that you're a trainer, you used to be a trainer, um, and I know that some people with exercise they I can they either do way too much or way too little. How do you feel that fits in? I think your question is my answer. Is that yeah, some people do way too much and and other people do way too little, and in between is, is really where the perfection lies. Well, to go a little further with that, what are some signs mm. that you're working, you're doing too much exercise? The main, hmm, uh, never recovering, that would be an obvious one. I mean, it, it's also relative to caloric intake and, and level of sleep, but if you're never recovering, that's too much for you right now. Um, if you feel cold all the time, really the same, you know, same type of things will happen. Too much exercise and too little food. So if you feel cold all the time, um, you feel grumpy all the time. Um, the interesting thing with exercise is there's almost like an addictive quality in that um, if someone's over-exercising, you know, for them, they'll literally be dependent on exercise for more energy. It's like a cup of coffee. It's like, yeah. I need exercise. It gives me energy. Like, well, that's because you're increasing cortisol, <laughs> because you're you're giving yourself that stress. 
so that, that, that to me is a sign that someone's exercising too much if they say that they're afraid to take three days off from exercise because their energy will be high. I agree. <laughs> All right, right on. Yeah, that's the main one. Yeah, on the topic, I don't know how many, you know, honestly, people love me at, at this gym I work at. Like, I work for myself, and I have my own studio, and my own online ventures, but I also do put in some hours at a, at a fancy club in the area. And honestly, people love me there because they, they just think that I'm the most just chilled out, relaxed trainer because, you know, everyone else there seems to be very mainstream. They've got everybody balancing on BOSU balls, doing bicep curls, and they've got everybody trying to push as hard as they can. And I'm always, like, telling my clients, I'm like, you know, rest up today. Chill out. I'm like, don't sweat that weekend, you know. You want, you want that wine? Have that wine. Like, relax. Chill. Sit. Have the wine. Enjoy that time with your family, you know. And, uh, and come back in and we'll, you know, we'll get back to it next week. And I think that there's, again, this goes into that extreme side of health. People are into health, but they're still into, like, extreme health. And that word extreme, no matter where you are, no, no matter where you put that word, right? Extreme eating, extreme fitness, as too extreme. That extreme part shouldn't be there, right? There's nothing mm -hmm. extreme about health, and there's nothing healthy about being extreme. Exactly. <laughs> well said, John. I just have to interrupt. You mean I'm not supposed to do uh, back squats on a Bosu ball? Just want to make sure we're clear on that. Is so that, that a good thing? <laughs> I think I think the biggest the biggest question is why would you want to do back squats on a BOSU ball? What is Isn't that it? functional? <laughs> do you do you spend do you spend the rest of your time walking around on a BOSU like surface? Oh, that makes sense. If you ever if you ever catch yourself in a circumstance where you actually need to squat something or pick something up off the floor, is it a BOSU floor or is it a regular floor? <laughs> There's your answer. Your answer yeah. lies with if you're looking for functional fitness, which is which is what the the BOSU is is supposedly about. Mm -hmm. um, there's there's absolutely no crossover between lifting something on a BOSU, and there's absolutely nothing um, uh, functional. Uh, uh, there's that 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 squishy surface. We just don't come in contact with that. That's not paleo. That's <laughs> that's not a paleo tool. <laughs> No, no, it's funny because you will actually get better at functioning on a bosu ball. Like there's people who can do some cool looking balancing acts and things on these, you know, squishy uh, balls. And but uh, then they just fall down randomly when they're outside walking. You get better at functioning on them, <laughs> but yeah, there's no there's no crossover. It goes deeper into that. Barbara's actually working on a huge post about it. Uh, it goes a lot deeper into the, into the nervous system and how it responds to this uh, type of, of movement, and I'm excited to share it with you guys. But yeah, right. simply put, anytime you got a fitness question, that my question back to you is why. Tell mm -hmm. tell me what you're going for. Tell me why you think it works, and we'll, we I would just hash out if that's practical or not, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's 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 dive into um, let's dive back into uh, the, the dietary dogma. Um, Sean, do you do you come across people who have been dieting low carb, vegan, whatever the case may be, for such a period of time that they actually need to just eat some processed food for a while to recover their their metabolism? Do you think that there's there's a place for that for actually eating some highly processed foods? Is there a place for that? Maybe. I don't know. I can't say definitively. I mean, there's something to be said for, I guess it depends on what that processed food is. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, by definition, you know, let's, you know, um, let's see. Let's just, for a random example, let's consider a pancake a processed food, even though that's mm -hmm. open to debate. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. you grab some bisquick, yada, yada, yada. Okay, okay semantics. Um, yeah, there might there might be some val value there if someone can tolerate wheat. Obviously, I mean a lot of you know by definition you know the the calorie to moisture ratio is rather substantial, so it's easy to get it in there. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, I guess that's the big thing. If someone really needs to get the calories in, then you know filling up on you know eating five thousand oranges isn't going to happen. You know, you're going to fill mm -hmm. up on that water before you get enough calories. You know. Um, so yeah, maybe you know, may, the, you know, chocolate bars or you know things like that obviously are very calorically dense in relation to uh, the the water content. So I guess most people would consider that 
uh, process. So yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in some circumstances. Yeah. What, what do you think, Eric? What did you think about that question that Joe asked? Good. I was just curious, what do you think? Do you think there's ever a time when people could or should purposely be eating processed food to recover from? I don't I, I don't know about to recover, but I feel like if you want to eat something processed, eat it. However, eat it knowing that you're eating it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Eat it with the idea that, yes, I'm eating a processed food, and I know this is not my typical diet, but mm -hmm. I'm... I'm, I'm Conscious and mindful that I'm eating this. And I guess my, to get to the to the to be more specific about the question, is there at any point is there an actual benefit to eating crappy food? Well, well, what do you think, Joe? That, that's right what, off the bat. That's kind of what I, I'm, I'm actually most interested in what what Sean thinks about that. Um, oh, but yeah. let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. Someone posted something today in one of the paleo, you know groups, one of the paleo Facebook groups, um, sort of touting, and I'm not joking about this, Fruity Pebbles as being legit because they use coconut oil or palm oil, saturated fat, as opposed to hydrogenated oil, saying, I'm, you know, I'm self-experimenting, fine, go for it, you know, but, you know, can, is this healthy because it uses coconut oil? So to, to use that as a very specific okay. example, something like Fruity Pebbles, is there a place for that? Probably not. Um, well, <laughs> I, I think it depends. I think, it, right, I think the context matters. It, mm -hmm. is someone, has someone been de battling with being overly restrictive about their diet for five years and the whole fucking time they've been craving Fruity Pebbles? In which mm -hmm. case it might be very liberating for them to get it out of their system. And that's, that's not something that I have any role in judging. Uh, that said, would I, you know, would I say that fruity pebbles uh, have a physical benefit? Uh, yeah, I probably wouldn't say that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, um, if, if we're talking about process, processed food in terms of like, you know, desserts and things like that that can be with high quality ingredients and just maybe have a high calorie to micronutrient ratio, that's a different discussion. But when you get into the realm of, you know, mystery ingredients, mm -hmm. um, that's when I tend to say uh, probably not worth that much of a risk. But again, I think mm -hmm. I think we need to take into consideration the psychology of this. Yeah, that's kind of exactly where I was headed with the, um, the answer that I was giving, that are there any benefits? I think there are some social benefits to it. I think there are... Um, you know, if if it, or traditional benefits, if every Thanksgiving your grandma makes a cake and you want a piece of that cake, eat it. It's totally fine. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that, yeah. that instance, I think it's totally legit for you to eat it, and you're conscious that you're eating it. I think mm -hmm. a lot of people are unconscious that they're eating all these processed foods, and I think that's where the problem comes in. Yeah, I think there's a. I think the perceived benefit from eating. You know, like using that example of something like cereal, fruity, fruity pebbles. I think the perceived benefit is that it's it's going to help recover metabolism. It's cheap, sugary calories, um, and you know there may be something to that. But I guess my point is, you, why can't you do that with something that that's healthier without without getting into the dyes and the chemicals and the preservatives and, and exactly like it. Exactly. I just yeah. wanted to add that yeah, both Sean and Eric had great answers on that the the social or the psychological benefits of what a particular food might be but in terms of like is there actual nutrient benefit to this is this what they should be eating uh yeah you know if it's got the palm oil the coconut oil that's great but you've got like gmo sugar gmo corn you've got all those colors you've got all kinds of whack i i would that that's just what i, I would yeah, you asked that question and it was like, I was like, no, I disagree. I don't think there is, yeah, sure, if someone wants to eat something, fine. If they're stressing about it, fine. But is that the optimal choice to, you know, repair or benefit anyone? No, I don't I think I don't so. think there are physiological benefits to eating processed pebbles. <laughs> exactly. There may be psychological or social benefits, but physiologically, I don't think so at all. What if you have Flintstones vitamins with them? Does that does that make it only all if they're the gummy variety and you, you chew a whole shitload of them? Yeah. When, when all 
Austin was trying to become healthy, he went out and bought Fruity Pebbles, like the, the <laughs> bottle. And he was like, look, I'm trying. I'm really trying. He only wanted it because it tasted like candy. And it was <laughs> And he really thought it was a legit store. So I think there are people mm -hmm. out there who, Sean, they might be like, you know what? I, this is good for me. Mm -hmm. there's, there's heavy metals in those things, man. There's yeah, heavy yeah. metals and there's colors and it's and it's all. Yeah, we can do a whole show or seven on on the shit that people feed their kids and man. But um, yeah, I mean, so what's so? Where's the benefit? Let's talk about that. Let's so the benefit isn't eating in fruity pebbles, but if there is some benefit from it, what what would what 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 is the benefit, and what other foods can we choose instead of the processed crap? Thanks, man. Good the fruity pebbles are mad good. I'm not gonna have a long time. <laughs> Lucky charms, man. Lucky charms. I'm all right. I used to, oh, I used to eat. Oh, Entire box of fruit. I was, I was all about Cookie Crisp, man. I was, I was a co Cookie Crisp fiend. <laughs> they didn't even like sell Cookie Crisp in Canada. Like, uh, they banned that shit too. You have I to get it like the Cookie Crisp know, police. Commercials, <laughs> but I don't know. I never had it. Oh, you know man. those commercials used to crack me up because uh, it would be like it was like a robber and a dog or something. Yeah, and, yeah, like, yeah. and that lady would be like, "Cookies for breakfast." And I'd be sitting there like, yeah, what is this shit? <laughs> I was like, I was like eight years old. And I'm like, they totally just nailed it. Like the ladies bring out cookies for breakfast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that ain't breakfast. Exactly. So Sean, what do you Man, oh man. Sean, what do you think about that? If there's some benefit to it, where else can we get the same benefit from what are the foods? Can We're we... talking purely physiologically, purely. Yeah, purely. Yeah, I, I get the emotional aspect of it too, and I think that's that. There's a legitimate argument for that. But what what, are the, what benefits could there be, and what other foods can we get that from? Hmm. I don't think a lot about cereal, to be honest. Uh, so that you're putting me on the spot there, buddy. Let's uh -huh. see. No, no. <laughs> I mean, the, the obvious, you know, the easier easiest step would be getting a better cereal. I mean, <laughs> I don't go in the cereal aisle at Whole Foods very often, but I know there is one. Uh, mm -hmm. so, I mean, that could be something. Uh, yeah, but it's, I'm saying, are you are they getting benefit from just the added sugar? Are they actually getting benefit from adding sugar back, carbohydrate, salt? What's you know? Yeah, probably all of the above. I mean, maybe just mm -hmm. getting the calories in there. Period. Um, I mean, it's it's. I have to look into. I mean. Um, I have to look into whether dietary sugar is in fact anti-stress. I know a lot of people believe it to be, mm -hmm. the, the Ray Geek crowd and such. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I think there's a, a, a logical argument there. I don't know what the mm -hmm. evidence says, but um, I think it's, it's a reasonable idea. So yeah, if someone's having sugar for breakfast. I actually saw a, a study that showed uh, lower cortisol. Who knows how good this study was? I think that's the only mm -hmm. the abstract is available. But uh, breakfast cereals associated with lower morning cortisol or something like that, or lower lower. I think it's lower total cortisol. I don't remember now. Mm -hmm. But you know, who knows the reason why? But we we obviously know that breakfast cereals are sugary. So you know, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe that is it. So you know, maybe there mm -hmm. is some legitimate value. I don't know. But. I think those are all plausible explanations. The, the the carbohydrates, the sugar, you know, the fact that you consume it with milk. You know, I know dairy is not mm -hmm. that popular these days, but maybe that's what it is. Um, you know, and yeah, just all of that stuff. I think it could be mm -hmm. any of it. Cool. Pie. Yeah. I think pie is probably a better choice than. I'd be more inclined to pie. I mean, it's filling. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Cereal's not filling. Especially with with ice cream, you can do some apple pie with some some ice cream. Yeah, ice cream is not good on cereal, so you you do make a good point. But cereal could be good on ice cream. So there's like little crunchy crunchy bits on there. Here, We're going way off off track here. It's always Bailey's <laughs> that I don't like piled out on all day, but Bailey's on ice cream over on the topic. Bailey's Irish. Yeah. yeah. Um, yep, yep, yep. I'm curious, just a little little survey here. Maybe we'll all do it, but starting with Sean. Um, what is sort of your favorite go-to treat in terms of your diet that you totally accept? And then what would you say is your go-to completely cheap food that is really not part of your diet? So two separate foods here. We got your favorite food to eat, and we got your favorite food to cheat. 
Right on. All right, so treat is an easy answer. We make this uh, coconutty chocolate thing. Uh, it's really simple. We melt down chocolate. We add in some coconut oil. We throw pour it in a pan. We throw it in the freezer. So it, it's this. It's almost like milk chocolate, except the creaminess comes from coconut oil. Uh, nice. So I love that shit. Um, cheat is a harder answer because I don't agree with the idea of there being such a thing as cheating. Uh, but if that sounds like say, dog to me, man. <laughs> 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 Whoa! Is that a cheat on that? Um, no, I think I know what Sean's saying. You just I don't know. call it a cheat. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, to me, a cheat. To me, if if I was going to call something a cheat, it would be something that makes me not feel good. Yeah. And in that case, it's a matter of doing the judgment call of, all right, this is going to taste amazing. I might be a little sniffly after, but you know what? It's worth it because I only do this every now and then. In which so case, guess, you're saying it's not cheating. It's just it's very, very moderated. It's a it's a very once in a while thing. Or um, yeah, but I'm more so. I'm just saying it's a matter of a judgment call versus of uh, rather of um, emotional and taste benefits versus the this is a physical immediate drawback. Okay. Um, All right, so what's your food for that? Uh, I have a few. <laughs> uh, the chocolate mousse I had last night would be one of them because there's oh. eggs in that. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that's, that's probably the top of the list. <laughs> that's pretty good stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. Navy pasteurized ice cream because I don't pas tolerate pasteurized dairy that well, and just all mm -hmm. ice cream is just fucking good. Um, yep. Yes, yeah, that's top of the list. What about you, Joe? Um, my, uh, you know, I, I, the same philosophy. I, I don't believe in calling it a cheat. You know, I think that's the idea between, between the, like the 80, 20 rule. Um, but I know what you, I know what you mean. So my, uh, my sort of regular non paleo food is, is definitely ice cream. Uh, I will eat that shit a lot. But as we talked about on the last podcast, my ice cream comes directly from a farm and, you know, days earlier it was actually in a cow. <laughs> you know, so it's, it's raw milk. It's, it's, it's you know, frozen, it's grass fed. You're able to get raw ice cream in your state. Oh, you know what's interesting? I had a question today, and I'll, I'm I have, I'm going to come back around to what you just said. I had a question today. Somebody, I don't know if it was on our page or the, or my Facebook page or whatever, but somebody said in the disclaimer in the beginning of your show, why do you say this shouldn't be considered medical or legal advice? And then if you need legal advice, you, you, you know, talk to a lawyer. And my answer is, I have no idea what the fuck any of us are going to say at the end of the show. But, but it, realistically, my thought is we're going to end up talking about raw dairy at some point. And that's really was, was the reason for that. So the, your answer is down. no, <laughs> it is not legal to get raw dairy in New York. No, interesting. But I, but I get it. I, I thought and I looked at the every laws. Every week. <laughs> I thought I looked at the laws and you can get it straight from the farm just like in Massachusetts. I thought it was something like that. There are, yeah, I mean, you can, you can, um, I believe in New York you can mm -hmm. get it from a farm, but you have to be like a shareholder in the farm. Oh, yeah. In other words, you have to own, like, own a part of the cow, so to speak. Um, it certainly is not legal in any state to cross state lines with it. In some states, you can't even drink your own raw milk, which is really ludicrous. Hmm. But, yeah, to answer your question, no, it's not legal. Yes, I get it, and it's delicious. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> so, yeah, that's my, that's my go-to sort of non-paleo thing that I consume on a, on a fairly regular basis. My, um, I, you know, honestly, the, the only food that I would quote-unquote cheat with would be gluten. And I probably do that two, maybe three times a year. Um, yeah, that's about it. If, like, my, my dad, who's an amazing cook, makes, like, homemade pizza nice. or something like that, then, you know, that was one of those instances where I'm just like, you know what? I'm not going to feel great after this, but the reward is, 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 uh, is better. So um, other would... than that, there's nothing that's off limits for me, it, you know, within that sort of 80, 20, 75, 25 rule. That I, I, I would totally take my dad up on the delicious homemade pizza if he didn't make it friggin' every week or <laughs> how many times the week it is. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, you know, just real briefly, my uh, my my big like paleo treat is um, 
I make what I call a decked out banana. And I take like a banana or sometimes two in a bowl. And I just like smother it with whatever I got. I throw on like almond butter. I throw on honey. I throw in chocolate chips. I make whipped cream and I throw that on top. And I throw a little sea salt and some coconut. And like it ends up being like this big. And uh, <laughs> it actually makes me feel like shit after sometimes. <laughs> but I eat that. Uh, and then I would say I would say a couple times a year. Uh, often, if I'm already pretty drunk, because that's already a pretty big eat, is I'll throw down a nice big plate of nachos all to myself. You know, corn chips mm -hmm. and everything they throw on. That's my favorite. That's good. And I, I seem to tolerate pretty, corn chips. That actually makes me feel pretty good at the time. <laughs> you know? That's probably good because you're drunk. <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah, I seem to tolerate corn. I seem to tolerate corn pretty well. So uh, corn chips are, aren't, uh, a, a, you know, or on something it's too rare for me. Eric, what what do you got? Um, within the paleo circle, just I love apples and uh, sun butter. Have you guys ever had sun butter before? No, what's sun butter? Sun, sun butter sun is um is sunflower seed oh, butter. That's a pussy cheat, bro. But it's yeah, totally. Like apples and sun butter, man. That's not a wait, 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 wait. I thought we were talking. Are... All right, all right. It's more like a it's your a favorite borderline drink. paleo treat. Okay, but my real big treat that I love is, um, well, first of all, first a bottle of wine. I mean, I'm, I guess we can say that is is that that's in my diet, bro? That's in my diet. That's to okay. totally in my diet. <laughs> that <laughs> was at um, the the there's a gluten free. It just so happens to be gluten free. I'm not trying to be good here, but the the store right next to your office, Joe. Uh, mm -hmm. Maria's is that it? Michelle, Miss Michelle's. It's Michelle, amazing. She yeah, has yeah, yeah. This, this sick chocolate cake. That's mm -hmm. amazing. I could eat that thing for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Is it the flourless chocolate cake? Yes. Yes. Oh man, I went to this place up up the road. This restaurant up the road that serves like pastured meats and, and things like that. And her, she she gives the her dessert. You know, one that flourless chocolate cake is one of their desserts. It's, and that was the first time I had it. Amazing. Out of control. Again, that's that's basically paleo. It's chocolate and you know eggs. It just and probably so a shit ton of sugar, but but I do I, I do love me some fried calamari though. Nice. All right, there you go. There you go. there it is. There it is. <laughs> we knew we just have to dig it out of you. There it is. <laughs> so Sean, mm -hmm. um, so what is your general take on for most people on on alcohol? And maybe let's say I can even understand that for certain people, and depending what kind of issues they have, if they got candida, if they're trying to lose weight, whatever, that there could definitely be a more strict restricted time period. But in general, for maintenance for people. Uh, what's sort of your stance on that? You know, what is what is too frequent? What is too much? Uh, what do you recommend to people? I forget what I recommend. Um, I have it in writing. It's probably because you drink too much. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's that, but uh, but I, I I'm the main thing I'm concerned about with alcohol is uh, the interference with uh, estrogen detox. Um, so that's my primary thing. Is I like to know where someone uh, is hormonally at. Um, before they, you know, you know, throw caution to the wind and a bottle of gray mm -hmm. goose. Um, I don't. I, I, I think, love you with the gray goose. Uh, I, I, <laughs> I, did, I do have a number written down because I know I'll forget. Right? How many uh, glasses of wine or whatever acceptable? Um, a couple of weeks certainly fine. There's there's no reason to, to you know be afraid of a couple of glasses a week. I don't remember the exact number. It's not low carb though. <laughs> <laughs> I, that's where I want to spend all my carbs if I was low carb. I was like, <laughs> only allowed 15 grams. I want it in liquid form. <laughs> <laughs> Probably make you feel better than you know a sweet potato, though. <laughs> yeah. John, why don't you um tell us a little bit about your practice and what you got going on over there? Sure, I got a few different things. Uh, so. The main, I'll go actually in order of uh, how people usually take advantage. So the primary thing is uh, I have a um, exercise focused program called, I really should have pulled up the name because it has the longest sub headline in the world, but uh, mm -hmm. the Fit Body Blueprint for Women, uh, a no-nonsense beginner's guide to hormonally and metabolically sound exercise. I think I nailed that. 
Yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, that's basically about um, how to monitor your own biofeedback and how to train in a sensible way that is uh, neither uh, suicidal nor uh, counter or not productive in the first place. Um, and then from there, I have. And they can find uh, that on your website. The uh, the best. Yeah, they could if they dig around. Um, the best website would be uh, fit, win, uh, fit Woman, singular, uh, fitwomanblueprint.com. That's where they can find that. Cool. Um, then I do um, I have an online coaching program that combines uh, private email compo uh, coaching, um, email lessons, um, and a private Facebook discussion group. Um, that enrolls. I usually have a new group start every I don't know, two to four months. Uh, still figuring out the intervals mm -hmm. for that one. Um, mm -hmm. Just had a group start, so uh, if you're interested, get on my email list and you'll find about the next one. Um, and uh, so yeah, that starts every few months. I have that online coaching group, um, and then I do some uh, private coaching, uh, phone coaching. I'm taking a brief hiatus on that as I learn how to do uh, some uh, functional medicine-based lab testing. You know, the adrenals, blah blah blah, all that. Hey, stuff. join the family. <laughs> So um, I want to do some rapid fire. I want to do some rapid fire stuff yeah. really quick before we let Sean go, and you guys can think of some stuff quick and, and uh, throw it out. So, Sean, your mm -hmm. your thoughts on, on these things? Uh, white potatoes. Love them. <laughs> intermittent, intermittent fasting. Uh, I would like to see a comparison of uh, intermittent fasting and um, stress hormone levels before I can endorse it. Anything else, guys? Veganism. Eat more meat. <laughs> <laughs> um, paleo. Uh, good in theory. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Uh, poofas. Fuck that shit. <laughs> <laughs> what, what is that? Polyunsaturated fatty acids. Oh, duh, okay. <laughs> uh, gluten. Uh, careful. Um, careful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, only eat that if you know you tolerate it. And if you tolerate it, then enjoy it. I don't, awesome. enjoy, I don't enjoy it because I can't tolerate it, but if you do, go for it. Dr. Oz. He seems like a really nice guy, and... Uh, no, I don't really have an opinion on him. <laughs> uh, let's, let's, let's keep that theme going. Uh, Gar Gary Tobbs. Uh, I, I really like Matt Stone's uh, pun about the moods that people get when they go low carb, and uh, that would be Scary Tobbs. So <laughs> I really, <laughs> I'm a big fan of that one. So that, I think, about sums it up. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely, okay. All right, uh, we got anything else for, uh, for Sean before we let him go? No. How long is that little beard? Can you give us a little? Oh like, yeah, 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 yeah. A good clear shot. Say something. We need the camera to get what? you. What? <laughs> yeah, look at that little. It's, it's pretty substantial. It uh, it obviously kind of collapses upon itself, but it uh, it stretches out pretty long. Are you going to continue to to grow it? Yeah, I uh, cause every time I cut it, like I'm always like, oh, you know, I really want to change the shape of it a little bit more. I like it when it's pointy, and. Uh, and then whenever I give it a small trim, I'm always like, "Fuck! I cut off way too much." So I'm trying, to, I'm trying to, I'm trying to grow it to the point where like I'm really uncomfortable with it. And you can, like braid it or something. So we actually did last week. Yeah. <laughs> I think it'll look cooler when it's longer if we braid it again because it, it really shortened up from the braiding. But uh. Mm -hmm. How long have you been growing that thing for? Uh. Not uh, counting counting all the trimming, uh, I think I started growing this like last year, uh, nice. beginning of last year maybe, um, and I haven't even taken scissors to it in probably two months. I want to guess now. Uh, you good to that thing? Yeah, mm -hmm. it's pretty killer. John, I, I do have a question uh, for sure. you before you go. Where would you like to see like the whole health and nutrition field go? Where would you like to see that go? Uh, can you ask in a more specific way? I'm not sure I'd answer that. Yeah, where, well, 
let's take your your practice for right now. Where where do you see your practice going? And then we'll we'll backtrack more into global. Mm -hmm. uh, realistically, you know, there's only so so many people that you can help with a one on one service. Right. So you know, I'm I'm very interested in uh, leveraging products and uh, group coaching programs, and you know, making myself available, you know, as I can for more intense one-on-one -on -one thing, um, but I really think things need to be leveraged. You know, the, otherwise, you're just helping what 20 people at a given time who can afford, you know, $400 a month. You yeah. know, that doesn't help a lot of people. You know, what's that? <laughs> That's not even, you know, zero zero zero, you know, one percent of, you know, the population. Um, so I think, you know, for from my end of things, you know, plus it's you know mutually beneficial. But you know, I'm very interested in uh, in trying to leverage things and uh, and plus, you know. A lot of like the the fit the fit body blueprint program, a lot of that was just to save me time and save other people money. I mean, there's no need for me to tell them all these things about training if I can just put it in an ebook and answer all their questions of what I think about training. And now, if they have a follow up question, they can ask me that, or you know, before we can move on to other things. But um, I mean, I think I think, and I, I guess. To go more broadly from there, I think the industry at large is going that direction where people are um, trying to find ways to leverage their their respective expertises, um, you know, and come out with online courses and ebooks and all that kind of stuff. And I think that's I think that's critical. Yeah. Now with the other one, if if I put it this way, mm -hmm. if you were in charge of let's just say writing a manual, you know, for for the large population at large to follow to to optimize their health what are some things that you would definitely incorporate into that manual hmm. um, I mean there's no substitutes for the basics sleep eat enough do some activity um, everything else is just minutia from there um, that's the big stuff Cool, that's, cool. not, that's, cool. that's not cool. that exciting of a that program. Can't charge forty-seven dollars for that. But uh. the, the truth usually isn't all that exciting. <laughs> no, exactly. No, it isn't. <laughs> right okay. on. Okay, um, Sean, we'll, we we will definitely have you back and yeah. uh, dig dig a little bit deeper and, and maybe get even more controversial. <laughs> Drop some more f bombs. I'm already gonna get an angry email from Gary Top. So uh, not that I not that I suspect he writes friendly emails. He seems a little too uh, low yeah. carb to write those. But uh, <laughs> shit, I'm digging my hole, man. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I had uh, I had fun. <laughs> cool, excellent. So one more time, where where what's your uh, what's your website? Um, URL SeanFlanaganWellness.com. I'm not going to tell people how to spell my name. They should just figure it out on their own. Uh, if they eat enough carbs, they'll be able to. I think so. I think glucose is very important for the brain mm -hmm. and memory. And you know, we did spell it out earlier. Uh, yeah. And then uh, the ebook FitWomanBlueprint.com. Uh, and then on Facebook, Sean Flanagan Health and Nutrition Coaching. Outstanding. Thanks for stopping by, brother. Thank you, guys. We'll, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Sean. Peace.